All right, everybody, uh, I'm going to get started now, and we're going to do an introduction to climate change. This is a topic I imagine many of you have some familiarity with, given uh, your backgrounds and the, the motivation that you had to come here. And we're going to be touching on a, a couple of scientific topics and not great depth. Uh, we assume that you guys are coming to the table with a fair amount of background on these issues. Um, I'm also going to say hello for a minute uh, visually because you've been looking at a screen um, uh, quite a bit. And I thought it might be nice if I just at least <laughs> made myself present a little bit more than just a voice in the ether. I hope you guys are having a great time. I hope that uh, all the material is uh, is working well. Of course, we apologize for any technical issues. It's a pretty uh, dynamic process that we've set up. Uh, and uh, you know, as always, please uh, send us questions. Uh, let us know how we can make this uh, uh, more interesting and engaging for you every step of the way. Uh, but, um, you know, we're checking in with all of the supervisors in the evening to see how things are going and making changes on the fly. So, again, just wanted to say good morning or good afternoon, and, and uh, um, I'll get going into this portion of the presentation now. So this uh, section of the presentation is going to focus on climate change and provide an overview uh, that's going to lead into some deeper discussions that we'll have over the next day or so about climate change with respect to local governments and in California. So I want to call out the sources uh, of what you're going to be seeing in particular. It's not all of it, but uh, I think there's you know a huge amount of material out there. Um, much of it is uh, deeply scientific, and some of you may have spent a quite a bit of time uh, in that space in your academic studies. Um, but uh, in our day-to-day -day work, uh, a deep understanding of the science of climate change is less relevant than, per se, uh, a, a good appreciation for how it's impacting communities and the kinds of forces and, and, uh, that are at play to manage it and respond to it. So um, one of the things that I've done is provide here, and as always, these slides will be made available to you, uh, some recent documents that are particularly uh, useful in my mind for providing a great jumping off point for climate change as topics. So we have the AAAS, what we know document, the Royal Society's climate change evidence and causes. And those are two really great distillations that provide an overview, link to literature and provide a pretty compelling, uh, in some cases, uh, discussion of some of the key uh, questions that many people in the public have about the science around climate change. So recommend those highly. Also, the IPCC's Summary for Policymakers, which came out recently, and a slightly older but still really useful document um, from the Economics of Climate Adaptation Working Group, uh, Shaping Climate Resilient Development. Um, and again, these will be referenced within this talk, so uh, you'll get a flavor for the kinds of content that's in there. So first of all, we're going to talk about what climate change is. And again, just trying to, to lay that even field um, and uh, I'm going to make sure that the question section boxes up. And so if people have questions, feel free to interrupt me at any point. So, oops, always clicking too many buttons. So climate change is all about the greenhouse effect, um, and which we know is absolutely essential to life on Earth. We could not exist in the way we do without the greenhouse effect. And it's really important that we know that and we put that forward because uh, uh, too many times it seems like this other thing or this thing that has been imposed on us or is happening. But it is a fundamental feature. And this, this leads to some of the contrary arguments, too, that the greenhouse effect is natural. So what are we worried about? But the sun serves as the primary energy source for Earth's climate. Some of the incoming sunlight is reflected directly back into space, especially by bright surfaces such as ice and clouds. And the rest is absorbed. Uh, by um, the surface and the atmosphere. Much of this absorbed energy is re-emitted as heat, long wave or infrared radiation. The atmosphere in turn absorbs and re-radiates heat, some of which escapes to space. If all heat energy emitted from the surface passed through the atmosphere directly into space, our average temperature would be about 10 degrees colder than it is today. So you can see how much that variation would have an impact on our life. So greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, we call them that because they produce this effect, this blanket effect, include water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And they act to make the surface much warmer than this because they absorb and emit this energy in all directions. So without this greenhouse effect, 
we couldn't have evolved life on the planet. Adding more greenhouses to the atmosphere makes it even more effective at preventing heat from escaping into space. Uh, when the energy is leaving, and I think I have another slide here. Um, whoops. Uh, you see that those the, the more energy that uh, goes into the uh, atmosphere and into the Earth's space um, that is not re-radiated out tends to trap that heat as well in energy and causes that increasing temperature. So increases in the atmospheric concentration of these gases cause the Earth to warm. Uh, this is the situation we're facing now. Significant increases in greenhouse gases are changing the balance of heat absorption on the Earth. There are four main gases of concern to climate change. Carbon dioxide, which enters the atmosphere through the burning of fossil fuels, such as coal, natural gas, oil, solid waste, trees, wood products, and also as a result of certain chemical reactions like the manufacture of cement. Carbon dioxide is also removed from the atmosphere or sequestered when it is absorbed by plants or other uh, biological carbon cycling. Methane is another major uh, greenhouse gas, is emitted during the production and transport of coal, natural gas, and oil. Methane emissions also result from livestock and other agricultural practices and by the decay of organic wastes in municipal solid waste landfills. Nitrous oxide is emitted during agricultural and industrial activities, as well as during the combustion of fossil fuels and solid waste. Fluorinated gases such as hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, and sulfur hexafluoride are synthetic powerful greenhouse gases that are emitted from a variety of industrial processes. Fluorinated gases are sometimes used as substitutes for stratospheric ozone depleting substances such as chlorofluorocarbons. These gases are typically emitted in smaller quantities, but as I'll show you in a minute, they are potent greenhouse gases because they have a high global warming potential. So for each of these gases, their effect on climate change depends on three main factors. How much of the gas is in the atmosphere, how long do they stay in the atmosphere, and how strongly do they impact global temperatures. So when we talk about how much gas, it's just concentration or abundance. Larger amounts have a bigger impact. Uh, to how long they stay in the atmosphere refers to uh, the different amounts of times from years to thousands of years that these gases remain in the atmosphere, long enough to become well mixed so they no longer have that impact. And then how strongly do they affect global temperatures? Because of their chemical makeup, they each can absorb and hold more heat at, or hold heat at different levels. So another way of looking at this is to think about these contributions in terms of uh, total load. So CO2, you can see, is by far the greatest contributor in the U.S. Uh, to greenhouse gas emissions. However, as you'll see in the next slide, <clears throat> it's not the most potent and it doesn't last the longest. So this shows the different global warming potentials of uh, the gases that are significant contributors to uh, global warming or climate change. And what you see here is uh, the global warming potential, which is a, uh, a, a factor of its ability to persist in the atmosphere and the amount of heat absorption that it has. And the way this has been designed is that carbon dioxide is, has a reference point of one. So that has a global warming potential of one, and all the other gases are referential to that. And you'll see methane, CH4, has uh, 21, so it's 21 times more potent. Uh, they have different atmospheric lifetimes. So you'll see that CO2 lasts from 50 to 200 years, but methane only lasts 12 years, whereas uh, carbon hexafluoride, or carbon uh, tetrafluoride, uh, last, can last over 50,000 years. Um, and you can see that uh, uh, the uh, concentrations of these things vary. So even though methane is more potent, uh, it has a much less uh, dense concentration, uh, and the rate of change is wildly different. And this is why CO2 is, is the, really the focus of much of our efforts to rein in climate change, because the rate of concentration change, and this is a little bit dated, but the rate is 1,610 parts per million per year uh, uh, increase or change. So I wanted to show you also this slide, which is probably out of a high school textbook, maybe. Uh, it's a NASA, actually, graphic, but it's a very basic representation of the carbon cycle. And since we're mostly concerned with CO2 as the main greenhouse gas, though methane has a, a, a very important role to play, um, we're going to look at the carbon cycle. And in part, this is to talk about how carbon moves through the different areas 
of our um, planet. So there's a, it goes between the biosphere, the atmosphere, the oceans, and the geosphere. The, uh, and each of these places has both uh, sources and sinks. And so this is in part why there's such a, a great complexity to modeling climate change, because there's so many different ways that these uh, carbon dioxide in particular, but other gases, move through the world. Um, and so you can see that uh, while, excuse me, uh, fossil fuels and cement production on that graphic produce about 4,000 uh, gigatons per year of carbon, uh, some of that is uh, reabsorbed into the ocean in the form of dissolved organic carbon. So it's basically fish and fish waste that die, that sink to the bottom of the ocean. There's an exchange between the surface of the ocean and the atmosphere. There's exchanges between trees and rivers, uh, between the soils and vegetation. So there's a constant cycling in, in smaller and larger ways. Um, it makes it really hard to track how all these things in an additive way are going to uh, result in net greenhouse gas emissions, where those emissions are going to happen, and what impacts they're going to have. For example, there's been a lot of discussion about the impacts of higher CO2 levels on plant growth, um, because you have two countervailing forces. You've got an increase in CO2, which generally we think of CO2 being a, a net positive for plants, um, but it's also warmer, so that affects their growing cycle and their seasons. They may be uh, getting uh, entering flowering periods earlier, and maybe the bees that are pollinating them or not. As you can see, really complex stuff. The other point I like to make about the carbon cycle and about climate change is that we are still learning an immense amount. Just about every day, if you if you pay attention to the climate change news blogs and the literature, you'll see something new coming out about a slight uh, nuance that's being discovered. Uh, and, and documented about the impact of something on climate change or climate change's impact on something else. And I have this slide up here, and I've, I've had this up here for a while since, frankly, this was really news. Um, but this is a, a creature. It's a larvacean mucus. Uh, or, and these are their, or sorry, excuse me, it's a larvacean, and this is its mucus net, which I... I, just the image of a mucus net always cracks me up, but, and you can see it's kind of this big balloon uh, in the slide on the right. And, and what it is, is it's a creature that lives in the ocean and, and uh, um, sort of grows and sort of lives inside this uh, bubble, essentially. Um, and then they cast it off when they're uh, decaying and they uh, become food and it sinks to the bottom uh, and it becomes food for creatures down deep below. And it was always sort of un not understood how did the deep sea creatures get their protein, um, but not only protein, but carbon. So you can imagine if there's this untapped uh, uh, learning going on about a big carbon sink, how does that affect these global climate models? And as we start to learn more and more and study more and more, we find these different sources and sinks. Uh, methane emissions was another one. Uh, recently, I think there's been some deeper analytic work on leakages in the supply chain for natural gas. And it was found that it was much more significant than previously understood. So suddenly your model, which might say, well, we're going to have a X percent, a 5% leakage from start to finish in natural gas, and that's going to have this kind of impact. Well, if you double that, you double the impact. And so it's really important that as we explore these things, we understand uh, the, the, the combination of forces. So I want to turn to sort of the evidence of change. Um, and again, these are coming from some of those documents and sources I mentioned. Um, and I'm going to go through them. You may be familiar with some of these graphs in one form or another, uh, but it builds a pretty compelling case. So all of the major greenhouse gases that we see are on an upward trend out of step with our historical records. Carbon dioxide is the most significant and widespread, accordingly at this point of time, as well as most understood, after remaining relatively stable at about 280 parts per million for millennia. Carbon dioxide began to rise in the 19th century as people burned fossil fuels in ever-increasing amounts. Um, and I think it's really important, this graph particularly only goes back to the year zero, um, there are ice core samples, and I might have one up coming up next uh, for CO2 specifically, that go back much farther. Um, they, they, they're able to drill deep down into the Arctic and pull out these large ice cores and sample the trapped bubbles of gas that have been there for you know, hundreds of thousands of years and measure CO2 content and extrapolate. So this is a, a fairly established uh, point of view. Um, so CO2 level in 2012 was about 40% higher 
than it was in the 19th century. Most of the CO2 increase has taken place since 1970, about the time when global energy consumption seriously accelerated. And when you look at that chart, that's pretty, pretty dramatic, the, the rise that we're seeing in these gases over time. Uh, and, and the spike, and it's been called a hockey stick uh, in Michael Mann's work, and you know, got a lot of attention for that as being kind of, um, I guess, out of step with somebody's thinking, but it's proven itself to be pretty accurate. Um, measured decreases in the fraction of other forms of carbon and a small decrease in atmospheric oxygen concentration show that the rise in CO2 is largely from combustion of fossil fuels. Land deforestation and other land use changes have also released carbon where it normally resides for decades or centuries. And this is an important one. Deforestation is, is a challenging one because forests are a great carbon sink. And so if we burn and take down forests, we're taking out both, we're creating more carbon, and we're also preventing carbon from being reabsorbed. Uh, comparison with CO2 levels measured in air extracted from ice cores, as I mentioned, here's that graph, 800,000 years. Uh, current concentrations are higher than they've been in all that time. And the upward trend continues today with, uh, I think, um, September uh, of this past of this year was the hottest September on record. And 2014 is looking like it's going to be the hottest year on record. And uh, in April of, of this past year or this year of 2014, we saw that uh, global concentrations were above 400 parts per million for the entire month. And I believe we've uh, we've hit that uh, a couple of more months this year. So I want to now bring in, as I bring in these changes, sort of how we've been looking at this issue over time. So many of you are familiar with the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the IPCC, and they've been convening for now, looks like 20 some odd years to look at climate change. And they've been doing a large scale study of these issues, bringing together scientists from around the world with policymakers, reviewing all the literature that's available and drafting some summary statements and recommendations. And they meet uh, periodically and issue these declarations. I think we're on our fifth round at this point. Um, in my mind, in my way of thinking, this is the single largest scientific project in the history of man. We are trying to understand our global climate the impacts of these various forces on it, and we have really unleashed a phenomenal amount of scientific effort upon it. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a great project in many ways, terrifying as in others. And, but the, the process has been really, I think, uh, the best that man can offer in some ways because of the amount of effort brought. It's also been really challenging from a political perspective. So back in 1995, this was sort of the statement uh, the, the overall statement about climate change that the IPCC was felt like it could make going through this whole process of review and then policymakers weighing in. The balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. Well, you know, in that time, and again, we've seen more and more data come out that these are happening. So we showed you CO2 temperatures or CO2 um, changes. Uh, this is surface temperature measured uh, uh, over time, annual averages. And you can see that going back to 1850, uh, a reasonably wide distribution of highs and lows, and then a general upward trend. You know, there's always spikes and always variations over the course of time, but the trend here is clearly moving into the more significantly upward trajectory. And these are coming from worldwide or widespread thermometer records. Um, and these have been done, uh, you know, um, uh, updated, over time to be increasingly high resolution, increasingly technical uh, in, the, in the, um, the way that they've been done. So in, by the time we got to 2001, the IPCC was stepping up its tone a little bit. There is new and stronger evidence that most of the warming observed over the last 50 years is attributable to human activities, most of the warming. All right, so this gets a little more serious and we're still seeing more change uh, in the ocean the temperature of the ocean you see has been going up. And so we've got the 1955 to 2006 average. And since 95, we've been above that. Since 1995, the, the net balance is up. You know, when you look at averages for stable situations, they can have wide variation, but over time, you don't see that consistent single direction trajectory. It's like flipping a coin. You theoretically could see uh, heads a thousand times. It's statistically possible, but it's very improbable. By the time we get to 2007, things are getting heating up, so to speak. Most of the observed increase in global, globally average temperatures 
since the mid 20th century is very likely due to the observed increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations. Anthropogenic meaning derived of people. So a little bit more of a wonky statement, but a stronger statement that we're seeing, the very likely due, okay? Other evidence of change, sea level rise. Long-term measurements of tidal gauges and recent satellite data show that global sea level is rising, with the best estimates being rise over the last two decades centered on about 0.12 inches per year, 3.2 millimeters. Um, so the overall observed rise since 1901 is about eight inches. And again, you can see that wide gray band there. That's the uh, reduction in um, uncertainty that's come from better measurements and better systems. So we're getting, getting a tighter read on that as we move forward in time and get better technical advances. So then we get to 2013, the most recent IPCC report. Um, and this is where we stand today with this body. It is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid 20th century. So in 20 years, we've gotten more certain, more able to point the finger at people, um, and the science has been the driving force behind that certainty. So why do I say that? Where does this evidence come from? Well, these are three studies uh, in 2009, 10, and 2013. First one being of 79 scientists, the second one being of 900 scientists, and the third one being of 10,000 scientists. And what they did is they looked at the literature, the scientific literature, to find out where uh, there was an acceptance or rejection of the notion of climate change being caused by uh, human beings, anthropogenic causes for climate change. Um, and they found some pretty stunning confirmations, 97%, 97.5%, 98.5%, a massive literature review that's looking at uh, the actual literature. Now, I think if you look at uh, common dialogue, if you look at public perceptions, if you look at a lot of other sources, you're going to see you know, a, a much uh, uh, bigger debate. But the people who are working in this field and who are um, uh, actually uh, doing this very complex work are very much in agreement about human cause, humans being the cause of climate change. And I think that, you know, for me, uh, you know, when we look at uncertainty and risk assessment, I, I've, <laughs> I've put my money and my time and my efforts into things that were much less certain than 98%. Um, and, uh, you know, at this point, I depart from the science per se and a, a sort of a, 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 you know, is it happening perspective to what's going to happen. So again, that was a very cursory overview of the science, a pointer, a suggestion to follow up as needed. But again, we don't spend a lot of time in this program defending the science. In California, uh, climate change is an accepted fact in a policy and political space, uh, not uniformly by any means. Um, in some jurisdictions, some of you will work in. It is not accepted. That being said, it is uh, sort of uh, built into our regulatory framework with AB 32, and we'll talk more about those later. But uh, we're about what are we going to do? And part of what are we going to do is about understanding broadly the science, but more what are the implications for mitigation and adaptation efforts. So uh, I guess maybe should I pause then and offer up uh, a, a stopping point for questions. If anybody wants to ping me from anywhere, I'm, I'm looking at the the uh, G chat supervisor G chat as well as the GoToWebinar panel. If anybody had any questions about the sort of the first section of this presentation, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, I don't want to rush through it. I know that, uh, like I said, I think some of you have had this material before, um, and probably at a deeper level than I'm ever going to cover it. Um, just giving you guys a, a minute to type up any questions that might be coming up in your group or comments even, uh, you know, I was very likely I got something wrong in there and I, 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 I hope one of you will correct me. No questions, says Julie, it's a good refresher but familiar from your group. Okay, anybody else? Everybody feeling feeling strong at this point. Okay. Well, again, feel free to ping me. I'll keep an eye on the. Oh, 
Ditto for us in Sacramento, says Jenny. Um, all right. So then, uh, you know, this is one of those like scary things. We try and avoid the gloom and doom approach mostly, uh, but there's a lot to be worried about in this space. So um, the big picture, the big picture is our climate is on a path to warm beyond the range of what has been experienced over the past millions of years. And that means we don't know. We don't have a ready model, a ready understanding and experience in human history uh, for what to do in this situation. The range of uncertainty for this warming along the current emissions path is wide enough to encompass massively disruptive consequences to societies and ecosystems. As global temperatures rise, there's a real risk that one or more a critical part of our climate system will experience abrupt, unpredictable, and potentially irreversible changes. So uh, we don't know what that point is. You know, the folks at 350.org said 350 parts per million, but we're already above that. Uh, and do we want to take those risks? Do we want to move into that space where that is the, the norm, that level of uncertainty? And also, how do we plan? How do we manage a society when it takes time to build things, when it takes time to uh, uh, map things out? It's really hard if we don't know two years from now the likelihood of a storm or a drought or a wildfire. So this, this, this space of uncertainty is the one that we're moving into, and it's happening in a lot of different ways. So this is a, a, a slide that just shows uh, some of the diversity of impacts, and I'm not sure how visible it is to you, but it shows some increases and decreases in different areas. Um, and I'll mention that, you know, as a, as a counterpoint or kind of the, the range we're talking about here, the difference between the last ice age, when America was covered in a mile thick ice sheet, and today it was about nine degrees Fahrenheit. However, uh, the warming that's occurred over thousands of years, today's temperature has already warmed 1.4 degrees in just over a hundred years. Okay, so that was a thousand year process that had a nine degree change and had a massive impact. And a hundred years in, we've already seen a degree and a half. The projected rate of temperature change is faster than at any point in the last 65 million years. So we are also on a trend to see maybe four to eight degrees of warming before 2100. So we don't really know, but that's so significant as compared to the past that it's really important. So we're gonna see changes in uh, all aspects of our life uh, and all aspects of our uh, terrestrial, atmospheric, biospheric, oceanographic uh, environment whether it's an increase in ocean heat content, species migration we're seeing all over the place, uh, tree lines shifting, uh, spring coming earlier, as I mentioned, uh, back a bit, and the impacts that has on the alignment between pollinators and, and plant life. Um, <clears throat> bringing it a little closer to home, there is a huge amount of real estate, by one estimate, two and a half trillion dollars in real estate at risk in California due to... Uh, you know, fire, sea level rise in a huge major area and uh, other factors. In, in another study, the costs of inaction could be 5 to 20% of GDP or um, gross domestic product uh, worldwide. Huge impacts on our economics. Um, flooding in the northern half of the eastern U.S., Great Plains over much of the Midwest has been increasing. These ex regional flooding trends would grow even greater with extreme participation. Drought, at the same time we're seeing flooding in parts of the country, we're seeing drought, and certainly in California, we're in a record state of drought. I think 99.9% .9 of the state is in extreme drought. Uh, heat waves, since 1950, heat waves worldwide are more frequent, longer. Uh, we might see a hot summertime increase of over 50-fold. In the U.S., new record high temperatures now regularly outnumber new record lows by a ratio of two to one. Wildfires have grown. We've seen these mega fires. Uh, um, uh, in California, we, we had a talk recently by the, the director of CAL FIRE who said that uh, in January they had already put out or were fighting 400 fires this year, and they don't usually ever have any major fires in, uh, in California in January. By the time, by August, 
they were fighting or had fought 4,500 fires. They're usually at about 3,000 change. It was a huge increase, a huge increase in both the risks, a huge increase in the budgets, a huge increase in the amount of uh, effort that needs to be done uh, to contain that. Sea ice is shrinking. Oceans are acidifying. Uh, the, the pH is changing because, and that affects all manner of sea life and most particularly coral reefs uh, where they're, we're decomposing uh, because of the greater acidification um, and obviously sea level rise. So a huge range of possible impacts, some of which are already occurring. Um, looking forward, these trends are expected to continue and accelerate uh, with the impacts growing ever more significant. That is if we don't do anything. What were once considered 100-year events will become annual events. What was once called a super storm will become a regular storm. And the planning and the logistics and everything else we need to do around that. So if you see in this slide, temperatures, heat waves, these are some estimates of the kinds of impacts that we might see going forward. Now, one of the issues that we have with climate change is the delay in impact. This is the global system. This is a large coupled system of many, many different dynamic interactions. And so you can't just turn off the pipe. You can't just shut off and everybody get out of their cars and we all start riding bikes and it's all good because there's a delay. So one of the things that we see here is that even if greenhouse gas emissions were to suddenly stop, Earth's surface temperature would not cool in return to the level of pre-industrial era for thousands of years. Um, greenhouse gases, as we've noted, take a long time to be absorbed and lose their warming potential. And so this is showing under a number of scenarios what would happen. And so the, the top line is sort of a business as usual. And you can see that the concentrations continue to rise on out to 2200. And then they taper off. Uh, but you see that the tail of that is very slow to decline. But the same is true for many of these other scenarios. If we were to really start to curtail emissions now, it would take a long time for that to actually really come back down. So it's really important that we make this change now so that we can start to um, die, uh, draw that out of the system. Now, this does not assume some radical geoengineering project where we uh, somehow extract all the carbon from the atmosphere and the heat and somehow, I'm, I don't even know what that would look like exactly, but uh, this assumes a more uh, standard technological path. This is another example of how this then links to the speed at which temperature uh, starts to stabilize and fall off. And you can see the rise is actually continues on. These are the same scenarios. But you can see that the temperature gradient is slower, it takes longer to pull out of the system. Um, and I'm not sure, frankly, what that little jagged line there about 2300 is, but maybe that's when the, the now tech comes online. This is a, another element of it, which is your ocean thermal expansion. So this is what contributes to sea level rise, principally the ocean gets hotter, hotter water takes up more space, it starts to rise. And this one is even more uh, dramatic with regards to the uh, long-term and delayed impact of the change. So we withdraw the greenhouse gas emissions, but it still takes an immense amount of time to, uh, to pull back. So another stopping point, on kind of the impacts and the impact scenarios. Any questions that I can take right now? Um, we're going to be shifting to kind of where are we at and, and what does this look like on the ground? I'll pause and take my cues from all of you. No questions at this point, unless somebody's uh, typing one in. I'm, at some, I'm just going to try at some point, maybe at the end of this, this session, to just open up the audio, see what happens, get crazy with this, and actually hear your voices, because I'd love to uh, not have to mediate this through our supervisors and their tired fingers. Um, but for now, we'll move on. So moving on to where do we stand. Uh, this is another version. Um, and a fairly recent one of uh, the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions I mentioned before, but it's then transferred into in the circle to where are those emissions coming from, right? So there's the sources of those emissions are really important when we understand what we want to do about this and how we're going to move forward. So you'll see that carbon dioxide, 
which is 84 percent. Uh, two percent fluorinated glasses, five percent nitrous oxide, four percent methane. Right, but where are those coming from? Thirty-three percent of the total emissions, not specifically carbon dioxide, I'm sort of spread out there, are from electricity, the production of electricity. Twenty-eight percent from transportation fuels. Twenty uh, percent from industry. So these are direct industrial processes. Eleven percent commercial and residential. That means mostly buildings, and eight percent from agriculture. So that alone points at where we should be directing our attention, the electric sector, transportation, industry. Electricity feeds into buildings, and commercial and residential, separate from electricity, usually refers to uh, natural gas, home heating, fuel, stuff like that. So the sooner we act, the lower the risk and the cost, and there's so much we can do. Waiting to take action is going to increase the risk, and, and this is helpful for us to understand where we can act and, and try to make some efforts. I also want to talk about some, some more local, give you some images and some, a feeling for some of the local impacts here in California. We are seeing a dramatically reduced water supply. Uh, this is Folsom Lake in January. It's hard to call it a lake. And look, at, look at that dam. You can see somewhat how far down or below the level of the dam the, the reservoir is. Um, we're seeing that incredible reduction in surface and groundwater. We're seeing wells running dry. Uh, in the Central Valley, and, and because of pa past and historical groundwater legislation, uh, we've not been able to do anything about it. And so folks are literally out of water in their homes. Um, and this has an impact also on the uh, wetlands areas, uh, less uh, fresh water coming in, more salt water coming in. Agricultural productivity, temperature increases, possible changes in precipitation are threatening agricultural productivity. We're seeing that every day. There was an article in NPR about dry farming uh, and the appeal of dry farming. Um, and so temperature rise, the possible changes in precipitation, reduced availability of surface and groundwater. These impact crop yields because of their sensitivities. It leads to maybe a proliferation of pests, the outbreak of diseases, uh, non-native species moving northward uh, native species moving out of a given region, and this all affects how pr uh, productive our agricultural system is. In addition, on these extreme heat days, you can't have people outside working as much. They are less productive, less able to actually bring in the food. This whole thing affects California's economy, which has a gigantic agricultural industry, particularly in the Central Valley. Um, extreme temperatures. Uh, we're seeing temperature in, in the region may be expected to increase by up to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit in a low emission scenario and by up to 6 degrees in a high emission scenario. Additional sources, you know, maybe 4 to 6 degrees. So uh, the number of extreme heat days are expected to increase. So not only is it going to be hotter, but there are days, uh, you know, just like with any other extreme weather event, you have the spikes. Uh, you got the polar vortex last summer back east, super cold. You get these super hot days. So even if the gradual increase in overall temperature is manageable, the number of days where we get seriously dangerous heat levels uh, is going to go up. Um, so the number of extreme heat days, for example, may be projected to increase by two to three times. Uh, this is, you know, uh, an extreme heat days are five days above 102 to 105 degrees. So um, if by the year 2050, we may save it two to three times more of those extreme heat days. Wildfire, I think we uh, anybody in, in the audience who's from California has heard stories up and down uh, the state of extreme wildfire this year. Uh, we've seen uh, right here in, in nearby in Yolo County, Eastern Sacramento, uh, have seen this. Um, and we're expected to see even more of that. And as I mentioned, that has consequences, not just in terms of the fire itself, but that's carbon released to the atmosphere. It's a carbon sink that is no longer there. It's risk to livelihoods. It's risk to the firefighters themselves. There's a huge budgetary impact in terms of the amount of money that we set aside for these, uh, um, these uh, uh, extreme event prevention activities. Um, I know FEMA is quoted as saying every dollar of, of sort of preparedness is worth four dollars that would be spent on response. And it always makes sense to do that. And we're seeing so many different ways that this is affecting us. 
obviously increased flooding. We might see a huge sea level rise, uh, increase in 100-year flood events. And again, it's those extreme events, and that's what we saw with Superstorm Sandy, that, that really overtop things, uh, the, um, the barriers, and can cause the damage. It's not the necessarily a gradual total increase. And a loss in biodiversity. Um, we are seeing uh, species extinction uh, happening globally. We're seeing changes in, in predator-prey relationships because of changing uh, seasonal activity. And this is all going to affect availability of food, water, and, and, and the, the viability of the different ecosystems that we live in. And this is happening all over California. And then social vulnerability. People are at risk here. Um, this is an example from uh, the Sacramento region where I sit today. And it shows different uh, social vulnerabilities according to one analysis. Um, and extreme weather is, is one of those factors. Air quality is another factor. Water availability. Um, these are all things that are going to affect, frankly, people. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's we're, we are making the problem. We also need to live through the problem. And so having an opportunity to look at our own impacts is really critical to mobilizing change. Um, so how do we approach this? How do we approach doing something about it? Um, one of the ways to think about this is, it's a, as I've mentioned many times, it's a complex problem. It's a complex problem with a lot of dimensions to it. And uh, we need to approach it with a, a complex and comprehensive approach. And this is a um, IPCC model of the different ways that we can manage climate change. So uh, we have emissions and concentrations that lead to climate change impacts, and we can adapt to those impacts, uh, whether by the changing how we eat, how we live, etc. We can also have socioeconomic adaptations in terms of economic growth, technology, population, and governance. And one of those options is to mitigate. So we, these things go hand in hand. There are some people who have said, you know, the big focus has been on stopping greenhouse gas uh, emissions and stopping uh, climate change. And I think there's an increasing recognition that climate change is happening and we need to do both. Uh, ad adapting to climate change is not giving up um, because if we can mitigate, we can reduce the future risks, even if they, we are going to experience disruptions today. So one of the uh, things I want to show here is this example from a McKinsey study who looked at the cost-benefit curve for mitigation activities. So I'm going to show you examples of mitigation activities and the range of thinking on that and also on adaptation. This is one I just like because it sort of highlights all these different ways that we could uh, mitigate greenhouse gases. And there's tons out there, some of which are more or less effective, some of which are stronger or better, more palatable, what have you. And in this case, they rank them against cost versus potential abatement. And you'll see that they're not all equal, right? So way, way, way over on the right is the most expensive um, uh, measures, and way on the left are the most inexpensive to the point of having a negative cost because they save money. Um, and the relative amount of the abatement potential is the thickness of the bar. So ideally, what you're looking for are thick and negative or low cost items. And so I'll point to a couple on both sides. So um, uh, let's take coal CCS retrofit. This is carbon capture and storage. So retrofitting coal powered fire plants to include uh, carbon capture and storage. And you'll see that all of that high, far left end or right end uh, has the CCS projects because that is unproven technology and it's uh, you know, we don't know how well it's going to work, and it's probably going to be incredibly expensive, but it has a potential to capture a nice chunk of the space. On the other end, we see uh, in the slightly negative area, efficiency improvements, other industry. And I think what that means is generally looking at efficiency across all industrial processes has a pretty significant amount of savings potential um, at a eventually cost-saving perspective. And then you get down into these lighting retrofits way down, switching incandescent to LEDs. What's fascinating about that one is it takes up a tiny amount of the abatement potential, but frankly, it's gotten a huge amount of attention as far as an activity. So you can think, is that is that necessarily, while it's cost effective, is it gonna make a difference? Is it gonna make the comprehensive kind of scale difference that we need here? Um, and I would say on balance, more of these things cost more than save. And another way of looking at this is that there are, uh, if you take a portfolio approach, you take the whole thing together and the total costs are going to be more modest because the negative savings are going to offset the positive savings. Now that doesn't help the LED manufacturer 
for the CCS manufacturer because they don't get that benefit, but potentially under more of a cap and trade type regime like we have in California, you might actually see some of that um, sharing of benefits. So lots of different ways to mitigate, many of which are under practice or being developed, but need to be scaled up much more broadly. Um, but come on. So some examples of adaptation, and I'm not sure why this is blank, but I think it was just a slide that got left here. So adaptation efforts, skip that one, because uh, it was not meant to be there. Um, there are a lot of different adaptation efforts going on. Um, it's even though it's a relatively new topic, uh, and audio is down. Huh? Audio is down. Audio is down. Ditto, ditto, ditto. We lost audio at twelve fifteen. All right. I will keep talking, but not go anywhere. Uh, I'm singing. Oh, I'm back. You, you guys got lucky. I was started to sing just to pass the time, and I'm not going to let that happen. We didn't hear about this adaptation slide. I haven't talked about this adaptation slide, so uh, I, we're all in a, we're, we're on the same page here. <laughs> um, so I was just going to show a couple of the things. Uh, these are just graphics of different reports and, and efforts that are going on around the Bay Area. Uh, I mean, not the Bay Area, around California. Uh, with respect to adaptation, and there are a lot of different adaptation efforts going on. I don't have the same kind of uh, graphic that I just showed you with respect to the greenhouse gases, because adaptation is newer, it's broader, you're covering a lot of different sectors and issues. For example, uh, trying to put into one space the issues to deal with sea level rise and also public health is really hard, or emergency management, uh, to try and look and measure against each other the adaptive benefits of green infrastructure versus relocation is really challenging. So we're just getting out there, but there are a lot of things going on. Um, and California is definitely at the forefront of these issues. Um, oh, So a term you may have heard increasingly is resilience. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you have opinions about the terminology that surrounds kind of environmental spaces, sustainability, climate change, global warming, uh, green. Uh, if you're ever interested, I'm happy to go on a rant about terms, um, but I will save you today. I will just say that resilience is the term that is currently being used a lot to talk about uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. It's in part a palatable term. Climate change is not a term to use in certain parts of this country. Uh, it is also one that evokes a certain amount of uh, hardiness. Uh, some also people also use preparedness uh, as another term. Um, it brings in different audiences. Uh, so you may hear this more and more um, as a term in this space. And generally, when we're talking about resilience, at least in my work, we're talking about mitigation and adaptation both together. And this slide uh, I like because it, it shows where they uh, support each other, where they can uh, benefit each other. So a lot of these things that we might do to mitigate may also have uh, adaptation benefits and vice versa. So for example, um, energy conservation and efficiency and different kinds of changes in land use that we we're talking about and relocation uh, could be, uh, we could look at different green building techniques that would accommodate both of those. So some of the SB 375 strategies that are around housing and transportation uh, could be seen in how we build our buildings. Um, we could see green infrastructure, which both serves as a carbon sink because you're actually increasing the amount and quantity of carbon in the region. So absorbing more carbon into the, from the atmosphere and also creating a bulwark against uh, so, uh, against um, rising tides and extreme weather. Uh, there's some great projects around Sacramento down by the Delta where they're really building up the land mass because it's subsided so much, but they're using a uh, natural infrastructure. So it's absorbing a lot of carbon and helping to protect the region against flooding. Um, water energy conservation, having water resources is a hedge against limited water resources, and it also mitigates because we use so much energy in the pumping of water. So these are starting to think about those opportunities can be really good. They're also conceptually, uh, they're a great way to dialogue with different communities. So some communities are very willing to talk about uh, flood risk or uh, maybe even sea level rise or reduce water availability or public health impacts who are not willing to talk about climate change. But when you start talking about the adaptive measures, 
you might find yourself moving that conversation into a, a mitigation conversation as well and vice versa there's some folks who are perfectly happy to talk about energy conservation but don't really want to talk about adaptation and so you might find it as a segue there another example of what resilience looks like um, this is a, a rooftop in chicago uh, one side of this uh, multiple building area has a traditional tar asphalt roof uh, you can see a bunch of junk it looks like laying down there i think they were painting when this picture was taken uh, and on the other is a green roof this is a roof that has been constructed in such a way that it can support uh, a layer of uh, soil or, or, or plant nutrients and it captures water and the plants grow and it's got some some benefits from a, from a sort of stormwater retention basis makes the building cooler on the inside and as you'll see in this picture this is a thermal image of that same building right so the building with the roof uh, the asphalt roof is hot as can be it is absorbing a ton of heat from the sun, whereas the other one is not. It's much cooler. And if you all remember uh, a number of years ago, Chicago had an incredible heat wave that left many people dead. And a number of them were killed because their upper floor apartments, where the heat rises, became overheated. So in a heat wave, I'd rather be in the building with the green roof, right? But that roof building also conserves energy, absorbs carbon, reduces water runoff, a lot of co-benefits. And that, to me, is a great example of resilience. I'm going to now go through sort of in a more organized way then some examples of resilience taken uh, sort of organized by the different elements of sustainability. So many of you have used the term or, or heard the term sustainability is a three-legged stool that involves environmental, economic, and social uh, sustainability. So I'm going to use that framework to show you some more examples and discussion of resilience. So when we think about environmental resilience, uh, we can think about the ways that we go about, uh, and I should say when I talk about the three-legged stool or any of these, they, there's a lot of bleed over from one to the other, but these are just sort of examples, cases. Um, so what I want to show in here are there are many ways through technology that we might create better environmental resilience. We can change the technologies that we're using. Uh, that means we can deploy more renewable power. We can deploy greener technologies. Uh, we can use energy conservation, what have you. Uh, we can also um, uh, switch over, switch away from one technology to the other. We can involve geoengineering. That would be uh, these large scale projects that would extract carbon from the atmosphere or change in some way or another uh, the, the way that the climate system is working. There's been proposals such as putting up uh, shields in the atmosphere and actually out in space that block some of the incoming sun. There's a seeding the oceans with iron so they absorb more carbon and sink to the bottom. Um, it seems like messing with the world is kind of what got us in this place. So I'm not a big fan of the geoengineering, but you know, we'll take that as it comes. Sequestration is putting carbon away into the plant matter, physically uh, pulling it out of the atmosphere and sticking it somewhere. We can also change how we live. So changing technology is one approach. We can also change how we live. We can cultivate uh, uh, lifestyle changes. We can increase the availability of bicycling, walking, increase, uh, bring up a culture of um, greater uh, self-sufficiency or reduced impacts. I know uh, recycling is only, you know, sort of a two decade, three decade old project. But for many of you, I'm sure it's the norm. You couldn't think about taking that can and throwing it in the garbage. Um, it's just become so normative in most of uh, this country, in fact. And so we can change how we think about the world. And we can adapt. We can shift things. We can transition. Um, those will be probably the more painful way to go, but uh, that is something that we can think about doing. Uh, when we think about social resilience, uh, we can think about um, how we do things to be more mindful of their social impacts. Um, when we think about technology changes, we should be thinking about not just how do we deploy the most, the biggest, the greatest technology change, but how do those technologies affect everybody? And there's a big debate that goes on every time that the IPCC meets and the UN uh, uh, conference of parties gets together about what's the role in the developing world versus the developed world for uh, taking responsibility and doing something about climate change. Because Frankly, uh, you know, there may be a lot more people in some parts of the world, but their technological level may be lower, and so therefore their total historical impact on climate change is less. But 
so who bears that responsibility? And so if we're going to develop technology, can we make it appropriate and help to transfer that technology? So for example, solar panels deploy more rapidly in the developing world and we have the opportunity to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, kickstart or jump over the industrial development that caused so many problems and, and help folks go right to clean technologies. We can also try and engage in socially responsible business practices so some of these problems be, don't become problems in the future. So uh, whether it's through green jobs, uh, trying to identify the jobs that are linked with a greener economy, fair trade practices, trying to both label and promote trade practices that support a more sustainable life, and thinking about our business products in a cradle-to-cradle -cradle model. These are all just examples. Cradle-to-cradle -cradle means uh, making a product that you sort of have a full life cycle stewardship from its beginning to the point at which it's recycled once again. And you can also think about co-benefits of these kind of efforts. You know, how does a mitigation activity affect health? How does energy security uh, affect poorer communities? You know, for example, having more distributed solar power might actually stabilize energy prices, which is good for low-income populations. And then we can think about economic resilience. Um, you know, how do we create a market for carbon? How do we value um, the adaptation activities, green infrastructure? We're in, in the middle of an experiment with this right now in California, we have a cap and trade program. In this year's budget, there's about $800 million that are gonna be deployed uh, across the state through various programs for mitigation activities. They are wide ranging. There are projects for urban forestry. There are projects for energy conservation. There are projects for water conservation. And we're gonna see whether or not this cap and trade system, which means we are capping the total emissions and we're allowing polluters to trade among themselves, uh, and we're auctioning off those, those permits and then using those permits to do further reduction activities. We're going to see whether this can work, this market for carbon. It would help if the rest of the country got on board, but you know we're going ahead here in California, and it's a great experiment to be a part of. Um, we can support low-carbon technologies and adaptive technologies, uh, and we can create incentives, uh, and that's part of what we're doing with the cap-and-trade program, but we're also creating incentives around things like uh, local property-assessed clean energy programs, which allow you to put the cost of a home energy improvement on your tax bill so it doesn't sort of stick with you as a loan. So those are all some, some approaches. And now I'm going to shift to talking a little bit more about California in the spec of what is California doing. Um, and again, uh, any questions, please feel free. You guys are, are quiet. But uh, again, I think I'm going to open it up, uh, open the phone lines up towards the end here, uh, which is coming up relatively soon. Uh, so California is on the front lines of all of these issues uh, as far as being concerned and taking action. And this is a survey from 2013 uh, of the share of adults in California who are somewhat concerned uh, or very concerned about climate change. And you can see that across the board, Californians have a high degree of concern about some issues more than others. So wildfires, air pollution, drought, more than flooding and storms. Uh, and the economy more than flooding and storms, but but generally very concerned about climate change. And in California, there are many opportunities to take action. So we've created a system through code, regulation, policy, and practice to do something about it, and we are doing something about it. So climate action plans, these are, uh, we've talked about some of these things, the sustainable community strategy, general plan updates, we're seeing codes and standard changes. We have Title 24 in California, which is our energy code, which requires the level to which buildings must perform in an energy way, and it's been ratcheted up uh, in several cycles, and the newest standard is coming online pretty soon, and it takes it up a notch in terms of what buildings, the, the level to which they need to perform. And our goal is in California, zero net energy buildings by, I think, 2030. That's a big goal. Um, and these are all pieces of ways that folks can get there. And there are people doing it. Uh, there are cities doing it. There are homeowners, business owners who are doing really pretty radical things all over the state. As an example of that, I just want to show you sort of in 2008 through 10, just a, a, the level to which uh, we saw um, uh, local action. So uh, greenhouse gas or mitigation uh, plannings adopted or in progress, 60 to 70 percent of local governments in California had that, and uh, 10 and then up to 20 percent were working on vulnerability and resilience issues, and that's already four years old. I should get the more recent data 
uh, and update this slide, but I think what it shows is that there's a large proliferation of local governments who are taking action. This is a couple examples I'll just put up here from some communities around the uh, state, um, some of which you'll be working with. The folks in San Diego are going to work with Chula Vista. They've got some really comprehensive policies out there around cool paving and roofs. Uh, they've got a grading ordinance so that we can accommodate 50 years of sea level rise. They've got an extreme weather component to their emergency operations plan. They've got a shade tree policy, which requires a 50% shade cover in, in parking lots. Uh, shade trees are really valuable. They cool off cars, reduce you know, the heat island effect, which is the amount of heat that hits the ground. Housing elements are in draft form, but they have a resilient design and construction piece to it. And then there's a huge uh, public education and outreach component to the policies that they're doing there. San Luis Obispo County, another example of some pretty comprehensive policies. Whoops. Uh, and um, they see they've got, you know, big coastal area requirements for new development that account for sea level rise in coastal areas and clustering for fire protection in rural areas. So these requirements were designed with a mind to forward to the future. One of the big conversation that goes on um, in many different circles is how much can we use the past as a guide? Historically, things like insurance and development looked at the history to determine the future. So if you saw, well, we had this many fires over the last hundred years, then we're going to base all of our design decisions based on that. We know now that that's incorrect. We need to forecast and build for that changing future. Uh, San Luis Obispo County has low impact development standards. It has tiered water rate structures, which means uh, the more water you use, the more you get charged for it, which creates an incentive to conserve. Uh, they're playing with crop selection patterns and practices in some of their agricultural communities. So um, another, some other really forward looking things, and some of your folks uh, in the San Luis team will have the opportunity to uh, review these and work with some of these communities. Come on. What's going on here? I am not going forward. There we go. City of LA um, just this year unanimously passed a building code update that will require all new and refurbished homes to have cool roofs. What this means is they use sunlight reflecting materials. It's the first major city to require such a measure and it was um, uh, it's really groundbreaking because uh, the I mentioned briefly the urban heat island effect. Essentially all that dark material, all that heat absorbing material that I showed you in that roof in Chicago, uh, creates a much higher temperature gradient within an urban environment than outside of that urban environment. And it's having a noticeable impact on those regions and those communities. And so one way to decrease that effect is to use high reflectance or high albedo materials. Um, but up until now, that's been a choice, not a requirement. And Los Angeles is making it a requirement. They're also looking at cool pavements because there's a huge amount of paved surfaces in cities. And all of these things will have a really significant impact on the albedo or the reflectance of the city and therefore its urban heat island effect. City of Lancaster, this is a really neat community and, and that's the mayor of Lancaster there in that picture. Um, they are aiming to be the uh, first net zero community in the world. This would mean that on balance, their entire community is using no power, uh, which means that, yes, of course, they are taking power in sometimes, but they're producing enough power to offset that and zero that out. So net zero power consumption. Uh, and if you want to Google uh, Mayor Paris, he's a great speaker, delivers a really powerful speech about his work and what it is. And what's amazing is that he is mostly business focused. He's a Republican. It's a conservative community. And he sees this as a, a no brainer for the long term resiliency of his community. So he makes a great uh, spokesman for the fact that uh, these issues cross all aisles and can be a benefit to everybody. Local government is also coming together. Uh, this is uh, Mayor Johnson from uh, Sacramento. Uh, and I think uh, some of our colleagues actually. I can see Kate Meese back there, I believe, our executive director, um, if I'm not mistaken, and some other folks from the Sacramento region, uh, talking about resilient communities for America. Um, 182 mayors across the nation have uh, uh, signed the Resilient Communities for America Agreement. This is a program developed by ICLE, uh, an organization that promotes sustainable practices among local governments. And they, uh, this Resilient Communities for America pledge sets out a roadmap for them 
for cities to improve and make their cities uh, more responsive and resilient to climate change. And this is Mayor Johnson, who serves as, I think, the chair of the Resilient Communities for America program. He's also the chair of the National Conference of Mayors, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, who put out the Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement many years ago. And so he's stepping out front on this issue as an important issue for uh, cities all over the country and Sacramento as well. Another example of uh, uh, what local governments can do and what communities are doing. This is the Alliance for Re Regional Collaboratives for Climate Adaptation, or ARCA. It's a program that Local Government Commission is also involved in, and it was formed in 2012 out of the urgent need to prepare California's urban centers for the emerging impacts of climate change, including extreme storm events, heat waves, droughts, and sea level rise. Uh, it currently involves the four regional collaboratives you'll see there, the San Diego Collaborative, the Los Angeles Regional Collaborative, the Bay Area Climate and Energy Resilience Project, and the Capital Region Climate Readiness Collaborative. All four of these are multi-stakeholder groups that are trying to organize and understand at a regional scale what are the impacts of climate change going to mean for them, and then coming together, how can they, whoops, how can they all organize to address climate change and uh, talk more to the state? What's exciting for us, frankly, and for you all, is that in each region that we're working for Civic Spark. Um, you're going to have some contact, either directly or indirectly, with these collaboratives. So our partner, actually, down in San Diego is the San Diego Regional Collaborative. LARC, or the Los Angeles Collaborative, works closely with the uh, LA County Office of Sustainability. Up in the Bay Area, BCDC is a member of the project and has been a part of ARCA. And also up in uh, the Capital Region, the Air District, SACOG, um, all of the major partners are part of that collaborative. And so all the members in each of those regions will get an opportunity. And we're actually proud to announce that the Sierra region, uh, led by the Sierra Business Council, who's our partner up there, is forming another collaborative that will probably be part of ARCA in short order. So you guys, uh, I say that by way of pointing out that Civic Spark is deeply embedded in some of the most forward thinking uh, work going on around the state of California, not to toot our own horns. Last thing I'll just mention is a, an event that we held this past August. It was the first California Adaptation Forum. So this is a conference dedicated to climate change adaptation held here in Sacramento. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and we had, we aimed for about 600 attendees and we had 800 attendees. This issue is very important to a lot of people and they want to do something about it. And so again, I'll mention Civic Spark is right in there as a resource and an opportunity and a network to tap into these people and for them to tap into us in order to move the needle on climate change in California. And I'm uh, you know, glad that we're, we're going to be getting you all out into the field to do this work. So to close on this session, uh, I want to leave you with a few thoughts. The first is, you know, obviously we are facing significant and accelerating risks. Uh, there is much uncertainty about what's going to happen. And it's leaving uh, our, our communities and our society in a place of uh, uh, grave danger, but also uh, a lot of uh, fear about what the future will look like. But we can take action. There are many, many opportunities for us to take action. You are part of that action. Uh, despite the uncertainty, we know a lot about what we can do whether it's through cap and trade, SB 375, so many different tools that have been deployed in California uh, at the state level and at the local level, we know enough to make some really critical, decision, dis, critical decisions. And that there are many cost-effective ways that we can go forward to reduce the risk. And we can do this in a way that grows our society in a healthier and safer and saner way, but we need to act and we need to act soon. So uh, with that, I will break for questions. Um, let me go back to the last slide and I'm gonna try to open it all. And if anybody, come on, how do I do this? Uh, unmute. Well, if anybody has any questions to type in while I'm trying to figure out how to actually give you guys the floor. Um, all right, I'm just gonna do it one by one much as I can. Uh, so anybody would like to say anything to the group as a whole? There we go. 
<laughs> Hello from behind the Redwood Curtain. Hey! Would, uh, would the Redwood Curtain like to say anything? <laughs> you guys have anything? Yeah, hold on. Here we go. All right. Hi, my name's Stevie. Um, I had a question about that slide about the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Uh huh. Um, we had the percentages listed. I was wondering. Um, I'm under the understanding that international trade and the transportation, the shipping costs, are not accounted for under our current free trade agreements. Um, so is that true that that information isn't taken into account? Um, you're, you're, remind, remind me again, me again which slide. slide. Uh, I had the percentages of the U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that's the one. That one. Uh, I think that you're correct. So the, the, the trade between the regions is not accounted for. Okay, okay good. If you, this is uh, Jenny from Sacramento. I might want to suggest having people mute themselves unless they're going to speak up. That would be probably good. good. Um, this is Susan um, on behalf of Aaron Brewster. Why are resilient efforts so far behind mitigation efforts? A great, a great question, question, Susan. Um, um, what, what we see is that uh, mitigation obviously is more of a new mind. Um, and it's been sort of the, the focal point, I think, in many preventative fields. You say, like, let's stop the damage before we sort of, or st before we start abandoning the patient. I mean, that's just bad analogy. Um, but it's been more clear that we're going to focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. There's a, a process by which we can look at what are the sources, um, but we didn't actually know how clearly, I believe, that, that the impacts were starting start to make themselves manifest. manifest. So it's, it's been more of a forward-looking thing to with that adaptation, whereas a mitigation we work on in the present, right? right? If we can stop these emission measures. measures. Uh, we're, we're seeing, seeing increasingly those, those uh, impacts moving in into the present, present time. time. And uh, it's, it's accelerating the conversation on mitigation, but, but uh, just by way of an anecdote, I was at a the conference that I mentioned, California Adaptation Forum, and I ran into somebody and said, you know, this conference feels like a mitigation, mitigation conference or a, a climate action conference would have felt 10 years ago. ago. Um, and now, in that time, you emerged a whole body of practice. You have, have protocols, you have procedures, you have measuring and, and meter projects, projects underway, the way and you're doing those gas and emissions. We're just not there yet on that. But we're moving more quickly, I think, than we did on, um, on mitigation. But I think it's that because principally, the question, question we have not experience in consequences. Now, now, if you do if you look, look at, say, the city of New York, York they have moved lightly fast for a huge city, city to develop, develop their, their plan and react to Sandy, Sandy and start to, start to integrate a resilient zone into their plan. Thank you. I have a question from the North Coast. Great, great. Uh, we'd like to know um, what is the purpose of climate action plans, and are they required by the state? Great, Great question, question, Mary. Um, a climate, climate action, action plan, plan is not strictly required, required by the state. state. However, However uh, it, it is a tool that, that can be used to meet other state requirements. requirements. Uh, uh, and, and principally, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a bit, bit of history here. here. So, so an, an, a number, a number of, of cities after 2006, 2006 when PP32 was, was enacted, started looking at climate action plans and started trying to figure out how to capture, capture and measure their emissions and start to plan for how they're going to reduce them, them in support of PP32 that was not statutorily required. Um, but Jerry Brown was attorney general. Uh, he really uh, changed that discussion by suing San Bernardino. Uh, over, over a general plan, plan amendment, amendment that did not, not adequately address climate change, um, um, and with enough specificity and with enough clarity, clarity that uh, they, they, they felt, felt that, that uh, they, they could, could 
adequately actually plan for the impacts of climate change, and what is a required statutory planning document, general plan. Um, um, and they so went they went back, back, uh, um, uh, they went back into their uh, general, general plan documents, documents and they, and they also, also created a climate action plan, action plan, I believe, Jenny, Jenny might, might be able to correct, correct me, um, and, and that, that was, was one way they were able to comply and satisfy the, the terms, terms of that lawsuit. lawsuit. And, that and that scared the hell out of local governments. governments. It really it did say, you know, you know we, we need to, um, uh, we really, really want, want to uh, not get sued in our, in our planning efforts. efforts. And, and, and so, so we're going to try and comply with, with this. Um, um, hold on one, one second. I'm trying to uh, get the echo out myself. Ah, I was the bad guy. So um, that was the, uh, the basis of a lot of folks starting to much more aggressively in integrate climate action plans into what they're doing. Also through the SEEK program, which you'll hear more about later, uh, we, we made it easier for local governments to do climate action plans. And finally, uh, a sustainable communities strategy, SB 375, relate sustainable community strategy that we mentioned yesterday, um, makes it easier for uh, local governments to get through the CEQA process if they have plans that are consistent with the sustainable community strategy, but that's often going to require that there be a climate action plan or general plan element that covers climate uh, on the books. So I hope that answers the question, and, and uh, Jenny, I'd certainly welcome yeah. feedback. I, I would like to just do one follow-up, and that is, where does the Climate Action Plan reside? Is it within the general plan, or is it a separate independent document? Great question, Larry. Um, it, it has been in both. Um, it is not a required element, so if you do one as part of your general plan update, it is an optional element, as there are other, other optional elements. I would say more often than not, it seems like local governments are doing them as uh, as, um, excuse me, standalone documents. And if I can jump in, I would also note that a lot of you will be working in communities that may have energy action plans. And um, in a lot of cases, this is because they have received funding from the investor-owned utilities, so from PG&E or the Edison or the gas company or San Diego Gas and Electric to complete an energy action plan, but the funding they receive makes it so they can't complete an entire climate action plan. So they have a big chunk of their climate action plan done, but not the entire thing. So that's another common uh, plan that you will come across that is similar to a climate action plan and ideally ends up being built out to an entire climate action plan, but is just a portion. Other questions, and I, um, several of you did not have muting enabled, unenabled, so I tried to send you a pin in order to do so, so I could unmute you, but if you're having trouble calling in, or uh, it's not my fault. <laughs> Any other questions I can answer? Well, okay. With that, um, we will break for lunch. Um, we're about 10 minutes early, and so I'm sure none of you will begrudge the extra 10 minutes to socialize, take care of paperwork, and uh, enjoy yourself. Hopefully it's a nice day wherever you are. And we'll see you back here um, at 1.30 for a presentation by uh, Assistant Secretary for Environmental Justice and Tribal Affairs, Arsenio Mataka. Have a great uh, uh, break.